Now, this next section, we're going to be looking a bit more at hair transplant procedures and really examining the dynamics of the hair follicle and how the hair follicle grows underneath the skin, as well as how the hairs come out of the hair follicle and how hair transplant surgeons deal with these unique challenges when it comes to different ethnic groups and just the various ways in which hair can grow and manifest in, you know, different looks. In a medical practice write-up and literature review titled, quote, Ethnic Considerations in Hair Restoration Surgery, unquote, Jeffrey Epstein, and no, not that Jeffrey Epstein, the guy who committed all those unspeakable crimes. This is a different Jeffrey Epstein. This is the Miami plastic surgery and hair transplant specialist Jeffrey Epstein. So get that in your head. It's that Jeffrey Epstein. But along with Anthony Bard and Garona Kuka, MD, the three explore the growing trend of diverse ethnic groups seeking hair restoration surgery, reflecting demographic shifts in the United States. And here we can get these hair transplant surgeons' understanding of the challenges that different ethnic groups and their hair face when undergoing hair transplant procedures. And this is this section mainly, right? is to show how different the hair follicles and hair of these different ethnic groups can be, particularly focusing on their hair count dynamics that each hair follicle produces. So let's delve into that. So these three hair transplant specialists, their practice serves a predominantly non-European, non-white clientele. So I guess you can say it's very ethnic because in, at least in the context of the United States, there are more so-called whites or European people than other ethnic groups. So we can really look at the differences in hair follicles. And they have clientele coming from various regions, including Latin America, the Middle East, and Asia. And they've also observed an increasing number of African American, Middle Eastern Asians, East Indians, and Hispanics, all these groups, right, seeking hair restoration. Now, the primary procedure performed in their practice is hair grafting or hair transplantation. And these ethnic considerations that must be taken into account include the density, diameter, shape, and mechanical properties, as well as composition of hairs that vary distinctly amongst Asian, white, and African hair. So again, depending on what group you belong to, it would necessitate that these surgeons use a particular hair transplant technique to accommodate. The medical write-up notes the round follicle shape of Asian hair, the elliptical shape of African hair, and the intermediate shape of white hair. And these sort of dynamics contributes to the coverage of these hairs, how these hairs go about covering the scalp, as well as their perceived visual density and their actual density by hair number count. It's noted that African hair has less tensile strength and breaks more easily, while Asian hair follicles are more metabolically active, making their hair grafts more vulnerable to dehydration. The density of hair, a crucial factor in transplantation, is influenced by the concentration and the caliber of individual hairs, with Asians having the largest cross-sectional diameter and high proportion of single hairs coming out of these hair follicles. So what is this saying? What are these hair transplant specialists saying about Asian hair? Well, what we learn once again is that Asian hair tends to be thick, wide, which contributes to its own unique density factor. However, within Asian hair, there is a higher representation of single hair hair follicles. Now, this is in contrast to African Sub-Saharan, you know, Black African Sub-Saharan hair, which typically has a decent density compared to Asian hair. And by density, I mean like hair count density. And that's the advantage of the number of hairs that come out of each hair follicle. But in the case of African scalps, it would be that Although they have a high degree of multi-hairs coming out of each hair follicle overall on their scalps, African scalps tend to have a lower hair count in general, but they do tend to have these two to three to four hair grafts. But not only that, but due to the nature of the curly hair, the curl nature of the hair, it maintains a greater degree of coverage which contributes to an illusion of greater density. And I just want to preface this by saying just because I said an illusion of greater density, that doesn't mean that Africans don't have great density on their scalps or dense hair in general. It's the fact that when you consider things like hair thinning and hair transplants, you can create a greater density 
or things can be kind of masked from how bad they actually are just because of the curly nature of the African hair. So when I say an illusion of greater density, don't think like black people or African in general or sub-Saharan Africans in general look like they have dense hair, but they don't. They may very well have dense hair or they may not. It's just that you wouldn't know because of that greater degree of coverage that that hair has. And again, that is a plus when it comes to hair transplants. So with that, people who have that African curly hair can get away with using less hair grafts due to that curly nature of each individual hair coming out of each individual hair follicle. And also keeping that in mind, when these people undergo treatment with, again, that coverage, that curly hair coverage, the hair that does come back to its natural antigen phase will likely make them look like better responders than they actually are. So a African Norwood 2 probably looks better than a Caucasian Norwood 2. An Asian Norwood 2 probably looks better than an African Norwood 2 or about the same as an African Norwood 2. And an Asian Norwood 2 probably looks better than a Caucasian Norwood 2. It's just due to these intricate dynamics between, you know, Asians having wider hair follicles that grow very long and very fast and Africans having curlier hair that tends to lay low on the scalp and maintain better coverage. These are the advantages between these two groups versus, I guess you can say typical, when I say typical, just the straight hair uh, Caucasian. In hair transplantation, when you take out a hair follicle, sometimes it may have two to three hairs, but depending on your ethnic group and what you belong to, you may have a higher prevalence of single hair follicle grafts, or maybe like if you're lucky, you could have like three or four. I've seen some pictures of a hair follicle producing like five strong hairs. That's, that's crazy. But we can see that there are different ways to get density, right? Again, you can have thick hairs themselves, thick hair shafts, or you can have a lot of hair counts coming out of those hair follicles. So it kind of varies between groups and individuals, but density is kind of like this, this factor, this within this one single factor of density, there are multiple ways to achieve density. Looking back at the L'Oreal diversity in hair study, you can see both West Africans and African Americans who, by the way, typically have, I think it's around 15 or 10 to 25 percent European DNA. But both seem to have decent hair densities. In fact, on hair density alone, in terms of hair count per hair follicle, or within some sort of determined measurement, these Afro-descendant people beat out several Asian groups as well as Caucasian groups. This so-called black sub-Saharan-based hair curl maintains good coverage due to its curl pattern. So with the Afro-esque hair type, you have density and coverage, which makes the hair much more fuller, I guess you can say, than Caucasians, and somewhat on par with Asians, or maybe a bit less than with some Asian groups. But again, it depends on the Asian group you're going to be looking at to compare to the particular sub-Saharan black African group. So already we can get a sense of what's going on. By their very nature, Asian hair tends to be wider. And I keep saying this over and over again, but I want you guys to get the point. When these hairs go back to their normal antigen phase, an Asian Norwood 3, an Afro Norwood 3 is probably due to the hair dynamics, its, its coverage and such, its, its characteristics, its features, they're probably going to look better than a typical Caucasian Norwood 3. And we get a better insight into especially the Afro hair and its curl by looking at this one particular hair transplant surgeon, Dr. Alba Reyes's approach to FUE treatment, as discussed in her study, quote, curly hair FUE, my approach using classification of follicle curvature and curl by Alba Reyes, MD, unquote. And Dr. Reyes elaborates the unique challenges of performing FUE on curly hair commonly found in individuals of African descent. The literature underscores the distinct nature of curly hair and suggests that in hair transplantation, individuals with such hair often require fewer grafts due to its inherent coverage. So notice the point. When it comes to hair coverage, you can give more of the illusion of density, meaning you're kind of using the nature of the hair itself to create the illusion of it being packed and visually, again, having a visually better Norwood 3 in one group 
than the other. So I guess my question here is, and my line of thinking is, how do these dynamics, at least from people that say, well, Asians that take finasteride or dutasteride, it's because of some sort of intrinsic reaction between the hair follicle and the finasteride and dutasteride that's separate from other groups, right? How do these dynamics between ethnic groups from the length of the antigen phase, integrity of the hair shafts, width, and weight of the hairs, as well as other factors, how do these differences dictate whether someone will respond to finasteride or they won't respond to finasteride, likewise with dutasteride? Because I think that is the part that people are confusing. It's not to say that other groups won't respond as well. They'll respond as well. Like if, if it is dictated that it tends to be the case that Norwood 4s can get back to a Norwood 3 if they take finasteride or dutasteride, let's say that's the case, right? Now, when you examine that and take into account the length of the antigen phase and how the hairs actually look like when they come back to their original antigen growth cycle based on the ethnic group, again, you may see that in group A, because they have unique hair characteristics, their hair typically being more dense and wider and such, maybe those people, those people of that ethnic group, again, their Norwood 3 probably looks like a Norwood 2, and they used to be a Norwood 4, so they have this crazy-ass response, right? Visually, at least. But in reality, they're still going from that Norwood 4 to Norwood 3. It's just the look of the hair kind of gives the illusion of it being better than it actually is. So we're going to be looking at some finasteride 10-year studies on Japanese men, as well as we're going to be looking at the five-year dutasteride study on Korean men. And we're also going to be looking at the 10-year long-term efficacy study that was performed in Italian men. So hopefully you guys are able to follow along with my spiel and we can actually delve deeper and try to go down this rabbit hole of it not being some sort of intrinsic response or unique response between the hair follicle and finasteride or dutasteride, but rather it's just these ethnic groups, they have their own intrinsic unique hair characteristics, such as diameter and the coverage that when they go back to their original antigen growth phase, and I'm being repetitive, but I want you guys to get this, when these hairs of certain ethnic groups go back to their original antigen growth cycles, that's when you start to see that, okay, they have other advantages out side of finasteride or dutasteride response. So yeah, let's get a look at those studies.